Hey guys, it's your host Julian. This week I sit down with character designer Steven DeStefano. During this chat, we'll chat the final season of Samurai Jack and how Steven got to work on the amazing conclusion of Jack. We'll also talk about his work on Primal and my favorite episode of that series, The Red Mist. We're also going to get really nerdy when it comes to comic books and we're going to talk about Steven's work at DC Comics. Before we roll into the show, if you guys haven't yet, head over to our Patreon channel and sign up for one of our three tiers. We're like Sierra, we're offering a lot of goodies over on the Patreon channel and it helps support the show. We've got a lot of cool things coming down the road and we would love it if you would join us on this journey. Now, on to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's My Head Podcast. I'm here with Julian. Today, I'm joined by Steven. Steven, welcome to the show, man. How are you? Oh, I'm well. Thank you, Julian. Thanks, thanks for having me. This is awesome. It's really, really oh. cool to get to speak to you. Ah, uh, man, uh, it's even cooler to speak to you, man. Uh, so if there's anything I've learned by looking over your resume and just watching some of the animatics that people put up of stuff that you did from storyboards to character designs and seeing some of the stuff you did, you got to work on two of my favorite shows of all time, one being samurai jack's final season the other one being primal um dealer's choice man where do you want to start you want to start in samurai jack you want to start in primal yeah let's let's start with samurai jack uh because uh because that came first um you know uh gendy won't remember this but um that's samurai jack i was supposed to my friend who my departed friend, my my the late Chris Riccardi, um, was a storyboard artist on uh, probably the first season of Samurai Jack, and I think by the second season or something like that, they he needed a partner. Like they lost a storyboard artist, and I was, you know, I know Chris from Los Angeles, but I was I moved back to New York where I grew up, and and he called me. And he's like, they we need a, you know, do you want to be my partner? And so I think I had a call from the producer too. And I was like, shit, you know, I'm working on this other show, but like, I'll be available, you know, in two, in a month, or two months or something. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I was really jazzed because I thought like, well, that, that's a cool, cool show, you know, that's really awesome. It'd be cool to work with Chris, even though I'm 3000 miles away. But, um, but like a month went by and then like I contacted the producer and she was like, oh, well, we filled that position um i was like oh fuck so you know um you know and i, I bought them cookies and everything i, I sent a tray of cookies to, to of like dicks. the production uh, yeah and i was really i was really bummed but i was so but you know what aaron springer the great aaron springer was ended up being chris's uh partner uh storyboarding mm -hmm. partner on that and Aaron was probably going to do it a hundred times better than I ever would anyway. So that's my first brush with Samurai Jack. Um, and then cut to like whatever it was, how long, how much, how many years later was it? And he finished it in the last season? Like 12, it was like 10 years or something? Yeah, it's like 12, 13 years, I think. Because I think it started in 2017. I think is when it wrapped up. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay, and yeah, I think yeah, it's. Yeah. It, I know it started in 2001, and it went 2004, I believe, the original run. So, yeah, okay. about 12, 13 okay. years after. Okay, that makes sense. Um, by that time, I'd worked for Gendy, um, a couple times. Uh, uh I, the, you know, Gendy really seemed to uh, go crazy over Dexter's Lab comic mm -hmm. comic book I did for DC. He he, he loved that. Um, he still talks about it to this day for whatever reason. And so he always remembered me. And after that, um, he called me to do storyboard cleanups on something called Unicorn, which another 15 years later is, is going to premiere on May 4th um, on HBO uh, and Max and Adult Swim, Cartoon Network. So, And then uh, I cleaned up that storyboard. And then he said that there was another thing that he was doing that, that got greenlit that was Symbionic Titan. He needed a he needed a, a character designer. I ended up being the sole character designer on that. And then after that, like, what the hell did we do? Now I'm now I'm losing it. Anyway, um, I think, you know, I was between things and I needed something to do. And he's like, Gendy's always like, well, I'll give you something to do. And um, you know, he wanted storyboard cleanups. He wanted me to do his storyboard cleanups for uh, the last several episodes. And so. 
I was like, yeah, sure, that sounds great. And so I came in, and you know, Gendy, his uh, his board his boards are really ambitious. You know,、mm-hmm. he loves a cast of thousands, and so I just remember drawing like thousands and thousands of grunt soldiers like marching over a hill.、Um, I don't know if you remember that scene because I、yeah. I remember it because you know it killed my soul and、um, and. You know, and I got to do a lot of, you know, a lot of cool fight scenes and stuff.、Uh, um, but、um, oh yeah, Hotel Transylvania that came that came after、mm-hmm. Symbiotic Titan. Anyway, so、um, so yeah, so I did I did a lot of story I did a lot of storyboard cleanups for him. And then at one point,、um, he needed、uh, I don't know where his background designer was, but he needed he needed some backgrounds designed for、uh, an episode. Um, I remember I got to design a futuristic toilet, which was pretty cool.、Um, but you know, designing backgrounds—you know—that was my first job in animation back at, at Spumco、uh, on Ren and Stimpy,、um, Spumco, and then Games, which turned into Nickelodeon.、Um, so I love backgrounds. I mean, I love to design backgrounds. They're—they're—you they're,、uh, know—they're a challenge. They're really interesting. And so Gandhi said, "You know, can you design some backgrounds for this episode?" And, And the other thing is too was like the backgrounds、uh, for、uh, back. Gendy always has some of the best backgrounds in the business, and、Absolutely. part of that is because he hires good design, background designers. But mostly, not to knock them, but mostly it's because his production designer, painter, colored stylist Scott Wills, who I also know from、uh, Nickelodeon games,、uh, Ren and Stimpy.、Um, Scott's just a monster. Scott's、yes. phenomenal. Scott's just phenomenal, and and Scott is like Gendy's right arm, really.、Uh, and then he has a couple of other left arms, but、um, I think I'm a finger on the left arm. But、um, but you know, I mean, it was great. It was really cool because I knew I know how Scott works, and like if I if I fuck something up, Scott's gonna just still make it look like amazing.、Um, so I, yeah, I, I designed like a, a, a war room. I designed like、uh, a couple of scary hallways. It was fun, but it was also really daunting. It'd been a long, long time since I designed any backgrounds,、mm-hmm. and、um, and yeah, I kind of choked because I remember like taking a long time to, time to do、yeah. them. And you know, Gendy's a pretty patient dude, but I remember him getting a little bit like, "Why are these taking so long?" And I I, I couldn't I couldn't tell him because I was just I was really I was scared shitless. It was、um, it just wasn't coming out of me. Uh, you know, if it if it's like a Ren and Stimpy background, I could probably, I can I can I can you know, pull out the stops on that. I can get that done ASAP. But to design something that like、uh, seems should have real perspective and real weight and stuff like that, that was that was daunting to me. And it's science fiction stuff, and I don't usually do that, but I can. It'll just take me a long time. So,、um, so yeah. So I eventually I got them done. And they looked okay, and then Scott made them look amazing because that's fucking Scott Wills for you.、Um, but um, yeah, so、um, and yeah, I think I can't. I just can't remember. But I think I I I、um, cleaned up the storyboard for the last episode. I remember some pretty cool stuff, but not a whole bunch.、Um, a lot of it is just kind of. I remember like. You know the futuristic toilet and the thousands and thousands of crowds coming over the hill, but otherwise,、um, a lot of it just kind of didn't stay in my head.、Um, of course, I love Gendy.、Um, I hope that comes through in the whole thing. Absolutely, Cause, man. Because、uh, <laughs> you know, he'll fucking kill me unless <laughs> if,、uh, he thinks I don't love him. So, but yeah, it was great. It was it was great. It was a great thrill.、Um, To work to finally work、uh, on what was like you know my 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 privilege my right you know I, I was supposed to like work on Samurai Jack and I finally got ten years twelve years fourteen years whatever the hell it was I finally got to work on it that was that was pretty cool it was pretty cool you must have sent some really shitty cookies you know what I mean what kind of cookies no man、send? I'm telling you no 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 they were <laughs> they were like good like they were good Italian. Uh, Italian、um, bakery, New York, Brooklyn Italian bakery shit. Yeah, it was really good. I, you know, they told me they were really impressed with the cookies. I guess they just weren't that impressed with like me as an artist back then. So you、uh-huh. know, I I can understand. You know, you know, I I 
I'd kill for a good cookie, but I'm not sure I'd give a kill for a good cartoonist. So. Oh man, uh, there's 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 something something special to say about a really good cookie, man. My go-to is uh, chocolate chip peanut butter cookies. I'm a okay. sucker for anything peanut butter. And then uh, my mom would make them, and she would make these like super fat, thick cookies. And you could probably okay. get like one or two before you get the beatus and want to fall over. But if you take that, uh-huh. and I'm, as, as you're going to get beatus by eating the way I'm going to tell you to eat it, get that, let them cool a little bit in the fridge so they're a little hard, and you get vanilla ice cream, put them in the middle, push it together, and then wrap it and freeze yeah. it. That way you get an ice cream sandwich. And oh man, you sleep no, really no, no, great no, no. when you get that sugar rush. Let's don't let's don't talk about cookies now because now I'm going to want one, and then that's not cool. That's that's really not cool. Let's I've let's stay a, off of cookies. <laughs> I've got a bag of them, and I've got THC running through my veins, so I'm going to get the munchies real good when I get off of this one. Oh, shit. Um, wow. yeah, yeah, it's going to be a great night. Um, so oh, getting wow. back to, to, to Samurai Jack. Now, you, you said a couple things that I wanted to circle back to, one being uh, the late, great Chris Riccardi. Now, I've gotten the chance to hear stories uh, of Chris um, you know, by talking to, I think, the first couple ones I've probably heard on on Randy and then Robert has told me some and then I've gotten the I've gotten very lucky to talk to a lot of folks that have worked with Samurai Jack that's worked with Gendy uh, worked on yeah. Samurai Jack worked with Gendy and other various projects and that crew is very tight-knit like you said Scott Wills in my opinion it's like he's top of the mountain when it comes to what he does I mean it's very hard for me to, to put anybody else in this league because the the thing that I found so breathtaking about Jack was the backgrounds it did not yeah. follow any other show you would have mountainscapes you would have ice you would have underwater you would have futuristic you would have uh this mad max level shit you know it and it was each episode was different and sometimes you would have four or five different areas or four or five different worlds essentially that scott would build with his team in an episode of samurai jack so it's just it just goes to the credit to show you like when gendy finds people he works with and he keeps them close it's just Everybody that I've ever seen that worked on these shows were true masters of their craft. I mean, like I said, it's second to none. The folks that have worked on Jack, that worked on Primal, that worked on Dexter, you know. So you guys, my hat's tipping to to, to you guys that got to work on these beautiful shows. Um, thank you. For, oh, thank you. Um, but I wanted to circle back to Chris Riccardi for just a second, man. Because yeah. uh, he's got probably yeah. one of my favorite episodes of Samurai Jack. And that was from the, it was probably the first or second season. I can't remember. Might have been three. I think it was season three. Excuse me. Chicken Jack, right? It's when Jack gets turned into a chicken. And then he has to okay. go through the whole episode. He's fighting as a chicken and all this other shit. It's just so fun. It's so whimsical. I remember seeing that as a kid and thinking, oh, this is really fun. And then seeing it as an adult, I'm like, dude, this is even more fun than I remember as a kid. And he, that was his episode. Uh, so do you have a favorite story, a favorite interaction? Maybe just uh, when you think of Chris Riccardi, man, what do you think about? Oh, lots and lots of, lots of things come flooding yeah. into my brain. <laughs> the first thing, the first thing, the best, the best compliment uh, that I ever got, I think, probably not, but um, it was, it was i knew i had arrived when chris said this to me i was you know i was when i arrived at ren and stimpy i couldn't i didn't know shit from shinola really and um i didn't know how to draw and i was learning and um you know and i learned by looking at chris's work chris was accessible to me some of the other people like you know i could never draw like john prefalusi but, uh, you know, Chris's stuff made sense to me, and I thought, that's the guy to shoot for. And, you know, um, as I, you know, as I learned and learned and learned, it was probably in season three, I think, when I, I started boarding. Um, and, no, it might have been season four, because uh, season three I sucked. But uh, <laughs> season four, I remember Chris coming into my, you know, we used to do, like, we what they called rifling you know you'd walk into you'd, you'd walk into your office and you'd find somebody looking for your papers um because mm-hmm. they wanted to see what you were doing um and that, it wasn't like offensive as most business places it would be it'd be like oh you're looking at my stuff um and one day i walked into my office and there was chris rifling my stuff and um you know he just kind of walked past me and he said he said when did you get so good um, and he and then he uh, exited the room, and I thought, oh, I'm, I think I've made it. That's pretty good. That's like that's that's quite a compliment from from Chris. So, um, so that's the first thing. Uh, here's my cat's tail, probably. Um, and uh, what else? You know, Chris. 
uh, there was an episode of Ren and Stimpy that had Santa Claus in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, yeah, Chris would just the, one of the line one of the lines was uh, s- someone touches Santa Claus's butt, like. And Santa Claus goes, ho, ho, ho. And like Chris would just say that continuously, which really reminded me, like, my brother would do that. I guess that, mm-hmm. that must have resonated. I didn't think about that, that at the time, but my brother would just like repeat lines endlessly. Um, yeah. So Chris was doing that. He also had another line. Uh, it was, uh, it was, he was imitating some cab driver he met somewhere along the way. And he would, uh, the line was, you are the son of my bitch. Um, he would say that continuously. Um, Chris, Chris was a hoot, but um, yeah, I, there there are other things. But um, you know, Chris is just uh, he, was, he was a good guy, um, yeah. and he was one of he was absolutely one of my favorite artists. You know, I, I just learned uh, so much uh, from Chris. Um, you know, and mostly just by looking at his work. I mean, he. He'd tell you what he was doing and, and why he thought something was better, but mostly I just I absorbed it by you know looking just pouring over his work mm-hmm. uh, continuously. He was, and uh, I mean I, I think I said this when he passed. You know, I, um, there's not a day goes by I don't think I don't think what would Chris Riccardi do? Because uh, yeah. you know Chris was a great great cartoonist. He would just cut through all the. All the bullshit, and he would get through to the most solid uh, form of what the cartoon character would be. And and as a person, Chris, you know, Chris had a really hard exterior, seemingly, um, but um, he, he didn't seem uh, accessible or vulnerable, at least to me for the first couple of years of knowing him. But I but but after a while, I, I just got to know him as a really really sensitive and sweet guy, and. You know, I, I just loved, you know, as a human being, he just always wanted to, better, to keep bettering himself. And I thought that was really amazing. I thought that was really, really admirable. Um, and, you know, Chris, I got I got close with uh, uh, Chris's wife, my uh, dear friend, Lynn Naylor. And that was, I got to work with Lynn, which was amazing. I learned so much from Lynn. Um, so, you know, I really got to be friends with them um and you know it's it's it sucks that i can't talk to chris anymore but um but like i said i mean there's i I probably think about him if not every day at, at least once a week once or twice a week hey guys it's your resident cartoon junkie brandon jones here asking you to have a listen to my animation destination podcast it's an animation celebration podcast and it's full of all sorts of stuff about anime and cartoons and voice acting and all that sort of thing and just a really all-around celebration of anything animated so come on by and check it out we've got fan episodes of your favorite animes to your most obscure cartoons on netflix that no one's ever heard of and just really love talking about it. You can subscribe to us on Spotify and iTunes and anywhere else you can get your podcasts from. So stop on by, subscribe, and stay tuned for the Animation Destination Podcast. So, uh, everybody that's listening, you never got to meet Chris. I'm really sorry for you. you yeah, out. I mean, the the it's it just goes to show you, man. It, it's these ladies and gentlemen. These folks like Steven and I'm talking to, you don't know when it's your time to go. Nobody does. Uh, you know, we've all got a, an end date. And um, this is what, like I told you before we started this podcast, this is why I do this podcast, because you never know when somebody that influenced you is no longer going to be here. So I always say, take the chance to tell everybody. You hear it all the time, don't meet your heroes, right? Because they can never live up to your expectations. I'm going to tell you right now, with the exception of one person, I'll tell you off air um, if you'd like one comic book artist and maybe he was just having a bad day uh from doing yeah. anything like this i've you know i've met every almost every hero that i've ever had and they've all been great they've all been gracious you know they've all gave me a little bit of their time that they didn't have to you know they all answered my stupid fucking questions um yeah. you know and they didn't treat me like an idiot so you know ladies and gentlemen meet your heroes and tell them what you think about them because 
one of these days we're no longer going to be here and I, I i know i appreciate it when people reach out to me and they they say oh i really like your show it's really fun you know i listen to it when i work or uh you know i, I didn't think about because depression comes up all the time on this one because I, I went through it a lot you know i've had friends that are no longer here because they made that choice that is you can't turn back from that choice that suicidal choice you know mm -hmm. um so you know mm -hmm. it's come up on multiple occasions with a lot of my guests you know and we've dived deep into that and i've had multiple messages where people said hey man that kind of saved my life because i heard that when i was in a real dark spot and if it would have been for that i probably wouldn't have been here so ladies and gentlemen uh thank you for those comments it it, it means a lot so like i said if you got uh if you're a fan of anybody out there make sure you try to tell them what they meant to you and uh what they did to help you out. Cause I guarantee it'll be a bright spot in that person's day. Um, you know, so thank you for being vulnerable right. and thank you for uh, sharing those stories about Chris, man. Cause like I said, uh, mm -hmm. him and, and Tuck Tucker, two people that I always hear about uh, larger than life characters, um, you know, fantastic, uh, excellent master crafts at, at what they do. Um, you know, so anytime we can sit here and uh, get a peek behind the curtain and, and really understand uh, your friends, I really appreciate when you guys can be a little bit vulnerable with me. Uh, so moving yeah. on to, you know, our uh, our next topic, man. Uh, Samurai Jack, before we get off that one, uh, beautiful ending. I told you this before, uh, before we hit record. Uh, that final scene in there where the ladybug that is essentially Ashi uh, ushering Jack to move on with his life gets me in the feels every single time. So that show, us fans waited so long to see the wrap up of that show like most people did within the animation industry I, I you guys are just as big fans as we are at home that don't work in the industry uh but getting to see that getting to see gendy um you know because i didn't understand what was happening like why all of my favorite creators were no longer at cartoon network you know gendy left uh you know craig was leaving van partible had left already john dill were so like all of these folks that kind of fostered and and created my childhood were no longer at the cartoon network they were no longer at the channel that i sat in front of for countless hours just i'm probably drooling i've probably got cheeto dust on my fingers and my and my little chin at that time you know just watching the cartoons go by so you know when we start seeing all of these folks leave especially for me i was like well, that's not how jack's supposed to end jack didn't get back to his family what what is going on so like as a little kid you know i'm seeing this shit and i'm just go man what the fuck man you know so getting to see him wrap that up and then i get to see it in a different perspective because i'm an adult i have kids mm -hmm. now and getting to see this it meant so bless you it meant so much more seeing this as an adult and it felt like i watched it for the first time you know watching that entire series again watching the final season um it felt like i watched it with brand new eyes because i was looking at it from a more grizzled person you know i'd been through some shit i'd had some perspective i'd seen some shit i'd done some shit you know i've done some yeah. good things i did some bad things so getting to see all of that wrapped up and getting to see gendy come back home essentially to where his career started and blew up and where i found gendy you know i thought it was yeah. very special and like i said that that final moment in that scene it doesn't matter where i'm at it doesn't matter if you know it doesn't matter what's going on i see that scene the waterworks start man so like i said hats off to you guys because you guys absolutely crushed that last season um yeah. so thank I you mean, for that you know one. well uh, definitely you got to talk to gendy someday i mean you got to tell him that he likes you know, one day i hope that uh, one day uh, i hope to have him on yeah yeah i you know it, it's amazing too because like gendy doesn't he never, he never lets anything go. He never forgets mm -hmm. anything. He always like, he always remembers his plans. And and you know like, you know Primal was, I, I first saw Primal uh, sketches for Primal, like eight years ago or something mm -hmm. like that. It looked it looked totally different. But and I was like, you know, I, and I knew by that point like Gendy has these ideas that he's never going to let go. That even if we're not working on it right now. Well, someday, you know, he's going to work on it. And then, yeah. and then eventually we did. And Here it looks are. completely different now. <laughs> it looks completely different now than it did back then. Um, but it's still pretty, that was pretty cool back then, but it's, it's cool now too. Boy, oh boy, is it, man. Uh, I was, I was not expecting. So I, I don't know who I had this talk with because a lot of these conversations, I mean, I've, I've got like almost a hundred and, 140 150 episodes worth you know i've only got about 127 give or take out um but i've, I've had 140 150 chats with people and a little bit more because i lost about five of those chats 
Um, so, okay. you know, sadly, it's, you know, I'll never get those ones back. My laptop was stolen back in the day. Um, oh, so shit. if you're watching that out there, person that stole my laptop, release those five episodes so I can see how shitty I looked three years ago um, and how shitty I sounded. But, uh, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, watching this show, I was just blown away. You know, I mean, primal. You, you watch this show, it comes out and it is no 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 dialogue is uttered whatsoever until i think the last episode so you go what is it 12 episodes i think in the first season 10 episodes somewhere around that range right um i'm horrible with with fucking descriptions as far as the titles go for episodes i'm horrible with how many episodes are in it you know um like we Me talked too. about i can't remember what we did last week let alone what you guys worked on 10 15 20 even two years ago um but that, that first season when you're walking through the entire show and I'm watching this and most of the time I have to do other things while I'm watching shit. Very rarely do I get to like sit in one spot for more than 20, 30 minutes, you know, unless I'm doing this once a week uh, and watch something because I usually got to cook. I usually got to clean. I'm usually doing something with the kids. So I got to be able to hear it and watch it. Primal was the first show that forced me to sit down. Samurai Jack was the same as well, but I was a little kid. I didn't really have priorities back then when Samurai Jack came out. Um, you know, so, but primal, I remember sitting down there and watching the first episode, you know, getting up and to go do some stuff. And then I come back, I'm like, where the fuck are we? I, I've lost like, why, what's going on? I was like, you know what? Let me rewind. Let me just sit down. I turned my phone off for 30 minutes. I watched the show and I'm blown the fuck away that there's not one piece of dialogue uttered in that entire series. Like I said, till the last few minutes, few moments of the, the season. And yeah. I'm on the edge of my seat the entire time. So I gotta yeah. know. Yeah, that that thirty minutes goes pretty quickly, doesn't it? It's like it just that kind of breezes does. by because, like, it's so, you know, it's so hard pounding and, and fast paced. It's like, you know, it's it's just you know, uh, it just goes right into you. It's yeah, pretty, it's, it's it's pretty pretty amazing. It's pure perfection on the screen when I saw this. Now, uh, I've I've always been curious. You you obviously said that you know you'd saw the you know some sketches or some boards of primal eight nine years ago um and you said it was completely different now can you one can you paint a picture on how different it is or maybe if you can if you can remember uh but the other yep. uh, the other thing that i wanted to ask as well um did you have to do obviously you'd work with kenny before um on quite a few occasions but do you have to do any kind of pencil test or anything like that i know you sent cookies the first time i don't know if you sent maybe donuts the second time and maybe that's how you got on or yeah. yeah, no, I mean, with Kendi, the, you know, the, 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 um, the Dexter's Lab comic book that I drew, that was, that was like kind of my test reel or, or, you know, or, or, you know, test run for Gendy. That was like my portfolio showing to Gendy. And then after that, and, you know, Gendy's, um, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's great. He's really, he, he's a great judge of talent, you know, um, it, it drives me nuts when uh, so many studios, uh, you know, my first job in animation was just like, I just showed my portfolio and I got a job. And then it wasn't, and it wasn't until much later I realized like, no, places like to test you. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you, you might get the job. And I always thought that was kind of a cowardly way out because if you look at somebody's if you look at somebody's portfolio, you should be able to judge. Like, yes. you know, when I, I was, I was the art director on, on the Venture Brothers and I saw mm -hmm. You know, this, this, he was a kid then, he was fresh out of the School of Visual Arts uh, here in New York, uh, Danny Hines. And I was like, and he did like these, these squiggles and, and like circles and shit. And I was like, this guy's good. And everybody was like, well, it's just squiggles and circles. And I was like, no, 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 he gets it. So, and that's what Gendy saw. Like he, he knew, like, you know, I got it and then I could do it. And then right off the bat, he just asked me to start like designing characters for him. So, um so yeah so you know gendy to this day he he trolls <laughs> he 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 looks for talent via instagram like he just kind of mm -hmm. goes through instagram he's like oh shit that's really cool that's how he found the animation studio for la cachette um yeah. for for primal and and just now uh, unicorn they you know he liked their real he liked what they did he was like you know i think i could work with these people or you know he finds other artists and he's like yeah, and he just like he goes with it you know he has a, he has a gut feeling and then he just goes with it which i really totally appreciate um mm -hmm. i think it's great i mean that's why again that's why gandy's so great to work for because he really loves artists he loves yeah. the art um he'll tell you that he's a he's a he's a lousy draftsman 
and that he needs he needs you know help from guys like me and Scott Wills and and you know others and, and you know I know what he means he just need, he just means for someone to sort of organize stuff a little bit to to straighten it out a little bit but great Gandhi is a, a killer he's a killer cartoonist he's really really yeah. good um, and there's a couple of things in my experience with Gandhi that Gandhi always kind of there's there's like uh, um, uh, there's like artists that he's always thinking about in his head. Um, one of them is Jack Kirby. Uh, who else? Um, you know, sometimes it surprises me. It's like Walt Simonson or or John Byrne or something like that. I'm like, um, I kind of get it. You know, he and I grew up in a similar time frame, so I get it. I get a lot of his references. But um, but one of the go tos, like, at least he goes to me for some reason, is uh, Osama Tezuka, uh, the creator of The Mighty Atom, Astro Boy, um, Kimba the White Lion, all these other classic, uh, amazing uh, anime and, um, and manga, uh, classic Japanese manga, the god, the god of Japanese comics. And um, Gendi loves Tezuka, and um, I've designed several things now that are Tezuka-based. Um, and they always morph they always change into something else but that's what um that's what primal looked like originally primal primal was supposed to be kind of um like uh a te he was like a tezuka caveman mm -hmm. he was very cartoony he you know kind of had popeye arms he still does but not really now he's more anatomically uh slightly more anatomically correct so to speak and um so it's just, it was just very very cartoony um and i don't know uh, he didn't show me any boards for that back then I, I only saw drawings um and i never saw a drawing i didn't even know like fang was going to be in it. i didn't even know it was dinosaur was going to be in it um yeah. so but um he, he gave me all these drawings of this very cartoony caveman and I started doing some, I should find those. I, mean, I might have like posted them on social media a long time ago. But anyway, um, yeah, so that's how it looked. And then, you know, eight years later or whatever it was, six, maybe, it wasn't that long for Gendy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when he said Primal's happening, you know, and I, I like went back to this, um, you know, this Tezuka caveman. And he's like, no, no, that's not what we're doing. Oh, it was, I know what he wanted. He sort of had Mike Mignola in mind a lot. Ooh, Mike Hellboy. Mignola, the creator, of, the creator of Hellboy. Yeah, and um, so I did a lot of, I told Mike that, um, God, that's you know, such a great uh, fucking pull. I never thought about that. Yeah, yeah, I told Mike that, like, you know, we're sort of, I'm trying to sort of do you when I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how the fuck do you do that? And he's like, well, you just draw everything that's there, and then whatever you don't need, you pull out. Which is great advice and uh, drawing advice, and I can never follow it because I, I have diarrhea of the hand. But um, and Mike doesn't because Mike's a master at that shit. But um, yeah, so so you know whatever from Tezuka to Mignola, the the character had uh, spirit changed an awful lot. Um, um, but you know it, this is. Gendy's evolution. This is how stuff kind of forms in his head, and you know, I'm just, I'm happy to go wherever he wants. It's like, all right, sure, fine, let's do, that's cool. Let's do, let's do Mignola now. Uh, you want to do Tezuka? We'll do that. You want to do Fleischer Brothers Popeye? We'll do that. Um, you know, Gendy has his team um, for like really beautiful from disney to like hanna barbera style characters for gendy he'll go to craig kelman that's mm -hmm. that's that's gendy's go-to for like funny stuff and you know for and for whatever reason gendy thinks i'm a superhero guy yeah. and uh, and no superhero guys think i'm a superhero guy so i'm not really sure what gendy's <laughs> seeing except that you know i read the x-men when i was a kid so i know what he's talking about when he's like yeah this should be like phoenix when she died yeah 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 that's cool um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm, you know, Craig gets all the funny stuff and I get all, uh, the action adventure stuff from Gendy for whatever reason. Although Craig is designed, he designed, you know, on Jack. the original Samurai Jack too. Yep. So, um, that was a much more cartoony show, but you know, he's, that's still a lot of action adventure. So, um, but, uh, yeah, anyway, so that's, that's the way Gendy thinks. <laughs> That's, uh... And like I said, I'm happy. Whatever, whatever he wants to do is cool.
So there's uh, a couple things I want to circle back to, man. Who's your favorite X-Men? Oh, uh, well, you know, when I was a kid, you know, Wolverine just looked so cool. Yeah. Um, and now, uh, I don't know. You know, I, um, it could be the Beast or because I like the Beast because he was blue and he was an Avenger, mm -hmm. too. I thought that was cool. Um, but, you know, for X-Men, pure X-Men, I think it's probably Cyclops. Because yeah. I feel bad for Cyclops, because Cyclops seems to be like the forgotten stepsister or something. He's he's like the serious one that nobody really, you know, thinks is sexy, and mm -hmm. you know he's so dutiful and like he's, he's all the boy serious. Scout. Yeah, and like he's he's trying to hold it all together, mm -hmm. and nobody appreciates him. I think there was just like ah, Wolverine's so cool, man. And it's like I don't know, you know, Cyclops is cool. I mean, I if I could shoot red beams out of my eyes i think i would be pretty badass i think all right so i think uh, my buddy, you know he's just he's the pure he's the only he's the x-men you know other yeah. than professor x i mean everybody else in there has been something else mm -hmm. um but he's he's only an x-men so i think he's great <laughs> well so with cyclops I, I never i have never liked cyclops because he's because he's got the Superman complex, right? He's the Boy Scout. He's never going to do anything wrong. Until about a decade ago when they did X-Men versus the Avengers. Did you ever get a chance to read this 12-part series? Mm -mm. So the Phoenix Force essentially comes back. I didn't think... Did you think that we were going to talk comics and be this nerdy when you said, hey, I'd love to come on your show? I'm, I'm ready for anything. I, I'm always Beautiful. prepared. <laughs> Always yep. ready. That's what they used to make us say when I was in the Navy. They'd ask you, are you ready? And you all, you, if you did not say always ready, they would literally make you do push-ups until you vomited. So uh, whenever I hear always ready, I get oh, Vietnam level flashbacks, even though I wasn't. I, I'm um, prepared to talk about the X-Men <laughs> as much as you like, but I'm not going to. I've done my push-ups for the day. I'm not doing any push-ups. <laughs> so, but um uh, man i can't believe you don't you're not you're not into you're not into the cyclops that's really well i get it i mean i'm not either but, you know he's the boring one well what did he do in avengers versus x-men well colossus has always been my favorite x-men i i love there's he's something great. about him yeah he's just so cool looking too that that silver that silver-esque i don't even know what that color really i'm pretty sure it's silver um you know it's such yeah. a cool looking concept um, and he had a cool ass accent when I thought when I was a little kid, I'm like, dude, he sounds different than other than Gambit. Gambit had an accent and you know, but now I'm saying only these three, but Rogue had an accent too. Everybody had an accent, but, uh, he just seems so different than everybody. But, uh, what I loved about X-Men versus the Avengers is the Phoenix force comes back and instead of it hitting Gene, it hits, um, it hit Cyclops, it hit Magneto, it hit, uh, Mar uh, Submariner. And I, it hit two other people. Maybe it hit Colossus, and I think maybe it hit Kitty Pride. I can't remember, but there was five people that it hit. And it was one of those alternate reality type of things. And then Cyclops essentially turns into Magneto. He's got this complex of like, hey, we need to save all mutants. And fuck the human race, because you guys have treated us like second-class citizens. Like we did not matter, like we did not exist, like we weren't supposed to be here. For the longest time and i'm not going to take your shit anymore so he essentially turned into walter white without selling blue meth and when they did that and they made the character instead of being black or white they made him gray i was like this is so fucking cool when you can give me a character that i can relate to that on my worst day i can say oh man if my kids were hungry and i didn't have any money and i needed to steal that banana from whatever grocery store i could I could understand why they stole that banana to give it to their kids, you know. So when you start making it like nobody's a good a hundred percent of the time. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. Even I'm not. I was gonna say somebody that was in the news that's a religious figure, but I'm not gonna do that because I don't think that's right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, just look at the news. You'll know who I'm talking about. Um, some weird shit. But uh, you know, it's it's like nobody is always good all all the time, right? So, but when he finally broke bad, and I was like. Dude, this is so fucking cool. You're getting to see a different layer of Cyclops, and you're getting him to see him come outside of this, this everything is good, everything is bad type of shell, and you really get to see a man, right? He's making mistakes, but you can kind of agree with the shit he's saying because, yeah, you guys treated the X-Men like shit for decades because they were mutants, they weren't humans. You know, so you could get and understand where he was going and why he was doing what he was doing, and that was the first time I ever liked the psych I ever liked Cyclops' character. So I thought that was a really cool storyline. So if you get the chance, man, it, they did twelve issues. I think they did it like two or three times. 
Um, but the first run, I think it was like 2010, 2012, somewhere around there. Um, X-Men versus uh, Avengers. It was a very good 12-part series. Um, okay, gotcha. Two things, two things about that. You know, I get, I always understood the metaphor about like, you know, hey man, you're treating us, you know, we're the downtrodden, we're, we're spit upon, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, like, they're superheroes. Like, how, yeah. how does the, how does the, you know, they, they, the world, the populace generally loves Avengers. I mean, not like, the DC world loves the Justice League, but like, okay, everybody loves the Avengers. Everybody yeah. loves Cap, but like those guys, we don't like them because yeah. they're mutants. How do, how do they know they're mutants? All they know is they're superheroes and they're saving people from like falling bricks and shit. So I, I never got that. That that always was the the, the X Men. Like, I get it. I understand. Like, that's that's very cool. I I get like you know the the total um, uh, metaphor there, but. It's like it always struck me as bullshit because, like, oh, they're superheroes. Who's, who's going to like yeah. think they're like downtrodden or something like that? And then the other thing, this, uh, you know, I do love Colossus. It, Colossus reminds me of um, when I taught character design. Uh, uh, you know, I always bring Colossus up because uh, I remember, you know, uh, the uh, new X Men were co-created by Len Wein, and I used to work at DC Comics. I, I remember Len, Len from when I was a little gopher back then. I remember him telling me that, Long like. Thing. You know, Colossus was originally the, he was supposed to be the focal point. He was supposed to be the Superman um, or uh, the Ben Grimm or something like that of, of the X-Men. He was supposed to be, you know, the main character. And the reason why, you know, um, and that's why he has red, yellow, and blue on him, just like Superman. It's like, yeah. that's the character you're supposed to look at. You know, um, uh, Nightcrawler is, you know, very dark colors. You're not going to look at him. And Wolverine, uh, who wants to look at a yellow guy in yellow and blue? You know, and, you know, uh, Jean Grey is like in green. You're not going to look at her. But like um, Colossus is the one you're supposed to look at. And then he mm -hmm. didn't become the focal point, which is interesting. Um, but I, I, always, I always remember that. It's like, you know, you put your strongest colors on the character you want. Uh, you want to have people look at of course, I, I looked at Cyclops because I was a weird kid, but that was, that's just me. So you know. I've never once I, I want to I don't know if you can see it. And I always hate showing my arms because I'm not a very muscular guy, um, but uh, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, man. Nope. No, probably not. But I'm a stand up and maybe you can. So I'm a huge Swamp Thing fan. I don't know. Oh, okay. if you, you can kind of see him. Sure. Right, yeah, yeah. I get it. Right. I there. totally get it. Um, yep. Yep. And. I'm a huge, 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 huge Swamp Thing. So when you said Len, my ears perked up pretty yeah. substantially. Um, obviously, Len and Bernie are both no longer here. Um, and uh, same, kind of same thing, if you had any kind of, uh, like with Chris, man, do you have any stories about Len? I would love to hear one if you got one, or even if you, you know, he taught you something pretty cool. Obviously, yeah. the, the Colossus Superman focal point thing was very cool, but do you have any cool Swamp yeah, yeah. Thing things? Um, um, I have a couple of Len stories. One was, um, you know, when I was really young, I was, I was, I was 15 when I started at, at DC. I was younger than that when I first showed up. Holy there. When shit. When I first started, when I first started, I was 15. I was, um, I was a gopher. Um, mm -hmm. one summer I was, I was an intern, a summer intern and I was terrible. I was the world's worst gopher. I mean, what is, what is a I gopher? I don't to interrupt you. You're supposed to go for this and go for that. Oh, okay. Um, and I was really bad at it. You know, I was really, really bad at it. And, you know, I remember one, uh, you know, it was just a bad day. And I mouthed off to the wrong person. And that's stupid when you're 15. I would do, you know, all these stuff that I, I would fire somebody, you know, if I had yeah. to deal with this guy. <laughs> anyway, I was 15 and I was an idiot. And I mouthed off to the wrong person. And then I got in trouble. And then, you know, I got brought in in front of the managing editor and he kind of gave me shit and told me I had to apologize to these other people. I wasn't really trying to be a dick. I was just, I was just stupid and young and I didn't know how to deal with business mm -hmm. type things. And anyway, it was a, it was a bad day and I did my duty and I went to apologize to them and I felt really dumb and I felt so awful. I, I, I went into Len's office and Len was by himself. I think it was just after lunch. And um, I, I started crying. I started bawling. I was just so upset. And I think Len was a little taken aback. He was like, oh, I think you should speak to Dick Giordano because Dick's really a great guy. Um, 
And I think Glenn was trying to say, like, dude, uh, this is a lot. But uh, Glenn, yeah. Glenn sort of stayed with me. Glenn, Glenn was, it was very, very kind. He was very kind to a, a really moronic 15 year old. Um, he was really nice. And, you know, I said to him, like, like Jesus, I, I can't believe I'm crying in front of you. Like, the dude that created Swamp Thing. And he's like, and he said, no, no, I created Swamp Thing to make people cry. And that was very nice. That was very nice of him. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, Glenn was just, uh, he, was, he was a funny guy, too. He had a good sense of humor. So, um, I'm trying to think. Was there something else about Glenn I wanted to say? Anyway, I, I mean, those guys, uh, you know, they were instrumental in giving me my start uh, mm -hmm. at BC Comics. Um, I think it was actually his lifelong friend, Marv Wolfman, who kind of got saw my uh the drawings that i'd sent in and said you know you should you should hire this kid as a as an, as an intern um mm -hmm. so that was that was marv uh it was great it was great to meet all those guys because i knew i certainly knew all the names from the comics i'd read as a kid um so it was real it was real it was a real pleasure a real honor yeah marv but... if you're listening i appreciate all everything you did for me that's funny it, it, it's so wild like you start peeling back somebody's resume. So on the surface level, I know you from animation. I'm pretty sure I've read at least something or seen something you've worked on for DC Comics. I'm a huge DC Comics. I mean, you can kind of see one of the boxes. Let me just turn it. I'm going to give you a peek behind the... the. Uh, so right there are all of my boxes. Obviously, I've got some you know other shit there, but a lot of that. And that's I'm trying to get everything down in my office now. Uh, because it was upstairs, now it's downstairs because we turned my last office into a nursery for the new baby. And then this one right. was a dining room that we never used. So I was like, I really okay. want to, I really, I really need a space so I can feel like a kid. Okay. And you can kind of see it. I've already started drawing on the wall back here. So you can see that that long strip right there is actually Jack's sword. And you can kind of see the outline of Jack's head up there. Oh, okay. So gotcha. I've already cool. started projecting and then tracing and then I'm... It's going to oh, okay. take me a very long time to finish it. I, I think I've got I've got Frankenstein Jr. up there and Mighty Mouse and anything oh, okay. that I've ever find, been a fan of is, is going up on my wall. And then I'm going to paint it oh, and awesome. get all these different colors. Yeah, you know, because like I said, you cool, guys cool. you guys elicited this emotion, this feeling out of me when I was younger. You to see all these cool characters do all this cool shit, you know. And like I said, uh, I, I've, I've actually been talking with Marv back and forth. We're trying to make, I haven't talked to him probably like six months. Um, our schedules are going pretty hectic between each other. And then, of course, last year, George Perez passing away. Um, you know, that one, that was so, like, I've got, uh, I don't think I have it down here yet, but I actually, I told this story when I was talking to Chris the other week, uh, Chris, De um, not De yeah, uh, Chris Suriotis. I was going to say Chris Stefano, but that's not right because I'm <laughs> looking at your name. <laughs> um, but I actually... It's somewhere around here, but I had a I had a headshot that George done uh, at a free comic book day. He was collecting money for all the uh, all the golden age comic book artists that were um, not able to oh, wow. collect any kind of compensation or any kind of money. They were having a lot of health issues, so they didn't have health insurance. So a bunch of the yeah. artists like George Perez all band together and they would go to conventions, they would go to comic book stores, you know, they would go for a couple hours and any money that they got for donations or people buying stuff, they put it into this jar and then they went and gave it to all, all of these artists that were from the golden age that were having health issues. You know, so I got to meet him yeah. uh, twice, I got to, or three times, excuse me, once at Comic-Con, uh, once at a comic book store and free comic book day. But uh, my favorite story, and I'm going to tell you this, even though I just told Chris and ladies and gentlemen, you'll hear it twice. I don't give a shit because George Perez is worth two, three, four hundred times telling the story. Um, I'm in a Panera Bread right next to my comic book store with my wife, right? And George Perez lives in the same area as my comic book store right down the street. I did oh, wow. not know this, right? So okay. I'm literally just bought, you know, uh, you know, the year prior on one of my last deployments. Uh, every trade that I could that had the name George Perez on it and the new Teen Titans, the Titan, like, so I'm reading all these Titans things. And then I go to get my comics on a Wednesday and I'm sitting there and my wife and I are splitting uh, um, a uh, steak and cheese sandwich. And then we each got a bowl of mac and cheese. So I'm eating mac and cheese and I happen to look up and I see him walk by and I've got mac and cheese just falling out of my face. I've got it in my beard. I look like an idiot. And then I drop my spoon and my wife's like, you okay? And I'm like, 
that's George Perez. And then she was looks over, she's like, who? And I was like, we're going to talk after after this because you need to know who George Perez is, right? Wives so, never know. What no, that about? no, she didn't. They, they, they just and then, don't appreciate George Perez. They don't. And it's such <laughs> bullshit, Stephen. So I'm sitting there and she's like, were well, you going to go say hello? I'm like, no, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to say go say hello to George. Per no, he doesn't want to be bothered, right? And he's wearing he's wearing his uh, what was he wearing? I think he's wearing a Superman shirt that his wife had made because his wife would make all of his T-shirts and stuff, right? The button up oh, wow. shirts and she would get the fabric and make his shirts. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, his, yeah, yeah. You know, so he's wearing a Superman shirt and he was just doing action comics when DC did the new 52. Um, so, you know, he was doing that whole thing. And then it was like eating at me. And it was only, this is only like 30, 45 seconds of me contemplating on it. And I'm like, I'm going to go talk to him because I don't know if I'll ever get this chance again. I'm never going to see George Perez out in the wild again. Right. So I go over and then I'm going up to him and his back's toward me. And I tap him on the shoulder and I go, I know who you are. And then he smiles and he's like, you do. And I was like, you're George Perez. You created my childhood. You created a fucking piece of my childhood. And then super awkwardly, I turn around and I start to walk away. And he says, hey, hey, hey. and I'm like, oh shit that was really awkward so i turned back around and he asked me what my name was I told him what my name was he said thanks for being a fan and he said a couple other things um that'll come to me you know a little bit later um but i got this moment with him you know i i got to say look him in the eyes i got to shake his hand the hand that he fucking created the teen titans with the hand that he fucking molded so many people's childhoods his artwork on cyborg alone like, I got goosebumps now just thinking about this. His fucking take on Cyborg is the greatest take on that character. In my opinion, nobody comes close. Nobody will ever touch that character the way George Perez took, touched that character. That no, sounded a lot dirtier no, no. than I meant it to be because we said Teen Titans. Yeah. But No, but I understand. Yeah. Yes, it's so beautiful. And I got to spend, and it was like a minute's worth of his time, really. And it was like, it meant everything yeah. to me to get to see him. And then a couple years later, I got to see him at a, a free comic book day and... I had my youngest son with me at the time and then he was collecting money again for the for the old artist and then he was like you look really familiar i was like yeah i was the guy that had mac and cheese all over my face i told you you were my hero uh last year at panera but he's like ah oh, what well, he started with a j and i was like holy shit he at least remembers a letter my name my name's julian so wow. we were talking for a little bit and then i was uh he was like well who's your favorite character and i was like well it's always been batman but i, I love swamp thing i love aquaman i love your cyborg and then i was like um, but my son here, he's really starting to get, and I think Hayden was probably like four or five, six years old, somewhere around there, my oldest at the time. And I was like, he really likes Batman right now, so I would like to get something for him. And he's like, oh, that's really cool. And he was like, uh, you don't have to pay for anything. And he's like, but if you want to donate. And I was like, yeah, no, I, we, we talked about this last time. So I, I put in like a 20 or $30. Um, and I was like, this is all the cash I have on me. I could get more if you'd like. He's like, no, any, anything helps. So I, I put like $20, $30 in there, and he drew like a head sketch of Batman. And then Hayden was like, oh, what are you drawing Batman? He was like, you're going to see something really cool. And he was like, that looks like a bat. He's like, yeah, yeah, but wait, wait, wait until I get done with this. This is going to be Batman. So he fucking drew this, you know, little head sketch of Batman. And uh, I'll take a picture of it and send it to you later. Um, but uh, he's a, picture, a headshot of Batman and then the bat cave and like a little bat or two around there. And he signed it underneath them. And it's just like him giving me that moment, but him giving my son that moment, even though my son didn't really know who he was. Um, yeah. You know, and he he's kind of already grown, outgrown Batman and all that other shit, you know, so he's into like anime and manga and stuff like that. That's what this generation's yeah. into. Um, yeah. But just getting to have that experience with George two, three times in a row and then him being such a genuine person, such a kind person and a person that 100 percent, in my opinion, I think he knew what he meant to everybody and him getting to experience that. I never saw a bad interaction with any fan. I never heard anything bad about George and the fact that he's no That's longer nice. here hurts so fucking much but I'm so glad that we got we got some time with George and we got to see the brilliance of that man you know so like I said uh, as always thank you for sharing the stories for Chris thank you for sharing the ones oh, sure. and then, uh, I'm gonna thank myself for sharing I'm just fucking with you for George but thank, thank you George you know like I said we miss we miss George man um, but getting getting back to you man I, I'm sorry for going down that comic book tangent um, oh yeah, but, no, I could do that. <laughs> it's, we're gonna have to have I, another I, part I'm, on I'm, here, Stephen. Yeah, right. I'm, <laughs> so, I'm always prepared to talk. I mean, you know, who who else was gonna draw the Avengers versus the JLA? Real, you know, like nobody. You know, I don't think. I mean, there was only one man that could that could do it. So it had, it's George's. George's was a, was a shit. You know, um, oh. just you know, my childhood too. 
Yeah, one of the, one of the greatest of all time, man. If there's a Mount Rushmore, he's on it four times in a row. It's him and Jim Lee as far as my favorite favorite artists go for when it comes to comic. But I love Jim Lee's Batman, and like I said, I don't think anybody can touch the level of artistry. I don't even know what the right word is that that George was putting out there. I mean, it's just it's so chef's kiss essentially is what I'm getting at, man. There's there's no none better in my opinion, but.